So our first activity obviously was the, um, uh, our, our, our public opinion poll surveys, right? You guys went out, we, we did that survey, collect that data. So the, the second part of our, our data collection for this course is, uh, for the last 13 years, has been our, our seafood surveys. We normally would have started that before Thanksgiving, but that, it obviously is all screwed up. So I, I've reduced the, num the amount of work everybody's responsible for, but we're still doing it, right? So what I think we're gonna do is we're gonna do a hybrid, like a sort of beefier assignment of this, and we're gonna call it a day, right? But that means you guys have to go do this, right? So if you guys don't collect the data, then we're gonna have a regular final, right? So, um, so I wanna explain to you, so again, there's, hopefully you guys have already watched some of those links I sent out, whatever it was, three weeks ago now or something, right? I'll resend those out. But we're just, we don't have time to go through all my lectures on seafood and stuff, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm showing you guys some of our old, some of my old archive lectures. So maybe not, not this year's data, but you know, the concepts and everything are all still the same. So I do want you guys to watch those. So I know that there's a lot of watching videos outside of class, but we just, we don't have the time to do it um, face to face. Okay, let's talk about our seafood component though. Um, this. What's going on locally is, is, the, is the main challenge of this activity, of this stuff. So these are our seafood surveys. Um, by way of introduction, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Many of our marine dwelling and coastal dwelling critters don't follow the classic population dynamic, um, population classic, uh, classic population dynamics of things that we've thought about for a long time. So for example, if we want to know how many baby deer, what the population of the deer in this valley will be next year, what we typically go is we go count the number of pregnant moms, right? Number of pregnant mom deer and, and, and how many total deer are there in the valley, that's going to give us an indication of next year how many deer we have in the area, right? So that would be an example of a so-called classically closed population, meaning the, the additions and subtractions, everything is happening within this you know, closed arena, right? And we, we, um, we, we can uh, relatively easily estimate the deaths, the births, all that stuff. In contrast, a lot of our coastal and marine populations, particularly the things that we want to eat in terms of seafood and fisheries, they are what's considered a, a, oh, an open population or, or experience open population dynamics, meaning, uh, and, and, and sorry, and that's driven by this. It's driven by the so-called bipartite, the two-part life history of these critters, meaning we have the part that you and I typically think of, in this case, which is the, the fish, the, the, the rock fish, right? So that's what we think of as the fish. That's the adult, right? And so they're living, say, on a reef, on a kelp bed, say, off of, off of uh, Point Magoo or something like that, and they're doing their due. They basically live on that kelp bed or, or that, that network of a few next, you know, adjacent kelp beds, okay? And they do the do. And so their, their whole life, they're basically attached. You can think of them sort of like a barnacle, right? A barnacle physically glues him or herself to the, to the rock and, and the adult doesn't move at all, right? Obviously these guys aren't glued to the reef, but essentially they're sight attached. They don't go very far. That's in contrast to the little, to the lung, the young life history stage of that organism. So the egg, the larva, whatever, those guys are being, those are plankton, right? So in our definition, if you recall our definition of plankton, those guys are being, their movement is primarily being dictated by the currents. And so if you're an egg, if you are a, a larva that's developing, maybe you're up in the plankton or up in the water column for an hour. In which case I'm going to go from my reef to the next, to the reef over there. Maybe I'm in the water column for a week, in which case I'm going to be from this reef, now I'm going to end up over in San Luis Obispo, right? Maybe I'm in the water column for six months, where maybe I might go from California to Japan or to Hawaii or something, right? And so what that, what that does is that dissociates the, the, the mom's birth rate, the, the, the generation of new critters at a local site, it's not correlated to how many critters are coming into that population. You get what I'm saying? So it's so-called open. 
So, so the material, the, the, the organisms, it doesn't work to just count how many pregnant moms are on the reef. That's, that's not, it might be, but it also oftentimes is not correlated to how many fish we'll have here next year. So that's the big challenge. That's one of the main reasons why understanding fish fisheries, fish populations is so challenging. We, we don't understand all the factors that govern the babies coming onto the reef, right? We've made great strides, but there's still a lot we don't know. So this so-called bipartite or two-part life history that leads to open population dynamics makes it much more complex to figure out uh, is our population healthy, is our population stable or whatever, basically until it's too late. Um, and, and, and fish are also very much so, their reproductive output is tied to how big they are. So not all species, but a very, very common life history uh, a component of, our, of our, a lot of our fish is um, that, uh, well, one, fish can change sex. Some of these uh, fish are so-called sequential hermaphrodites. So a lot of times they start little as a dude, and then as they get bigger and bigger, they morph into a female. And, but regardless if they do or don't do that, it's, it's not a linear relationship in terms of their reproductive output. So, if, uh, so right here I'm showing you guys that this, um, that this, so this, is, this fish is, four, the standard length of this fish is 14.6 inches, okay? So this guy is 23.6. So this guy's not quite twice, less than twice as big, right? So you might say, oh, this guy has twice as many eggs. No, this one produces 17 times as many babies, right? So it's, so it's an exponential, it's a logarithmic relationship. So a fish is not a fish is not a fish. Bigger fish, older fish, oftentimes have a disproportionate effect. They're contributing many more babies, many more, much more offspring to the population. And then it goes, gets more complicated from here. We don't have time to go into it in this lecture. You can look at some of my other lectures when we talk about this. But, but historically, we've had a lot of big fish. So this was caught, uh, so this guy right here, this is a, a, a giant, we now call it giant sea bass, caught by this lady. Oh, hello, my petticoat, right? Um, and she just caught that thing. The title for this was a typical Saturday catch off the Magoo Pier. Okay, that's about 80 years ago. Clearly, we've changed this ecosystem. This was, this was the apex, these fish were the apex predators on our reefs. These guys would, if you had, if you were a little baby, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what the hell I'm saying, but if, if you could imagine a little baby scuba diving, <laughs> and this guy saw it, it would eat the baby. This guy would eat whatever the heck he could fit in his mouth. He's so-called gape limited. Anything that fits in his mouth, eat. Lobster, eat it. Abalone, eat it. I mean, he probably couldn't catch a sea otter, but he would try, right? I mean, these guys ate everything on the reef. Massively different ecosystem when these critters were around. Uh, here's, a yellow, here's a white sea bass. Um, here's folks pulling in um, bait fish off Catalina. So, so we've changed our abundance and distribution of fish because of our practices. This last lab activity is built around basically two questions. One, what seafood, what's the seafood that's available for purchase? And the main question though, the main, the main nut of what we're trying to ask, you are trying to ask over the next couple weeks here is, Let's say you guys, you know this, you took my class, you watched my lectures or something like that, and you're like, oh my gosh, some seafood is sustainably harvested, some isn't. Some stuff is relatively robust and the populations are okay, others are crashing and bad and, and in a bad place. So I, as a responsible consumer, I wanna use the power of the marketplace, right? Because Melvin here wants to become a finance dude, so Melvin's gonna use finance to save the coastal environment, which is great, right? And he's like, damn, I'm gonna use the power of the purse. And so he's going, he's like, okay, uh, Vons or Whole Foods or Canisteria, whatever the hell we're eating, right? I want to buy the most sustainably harvested seafood. I want to support those folks that are being responsible about their harvesting practices. I do not want to support folks that are doing messed up practices and things that aren't promoting sustainability. Yeah? So the question that you guys are going to try to answer is, can you guys, can people going, uh, that want to buy more sustainably harvested seafood, can you do that? Can you make an informed decision right now in Southern Santa Barbara, Ventura, Northern Los Angeles counties? Cool? How do you 
How do you define Yeah, great. So, so uh, here's, here's a kelp bass, what the fishermen call calico bass, but they're stupid. It's called, uh, it's called a, a kelp bass. That's a real name, so we'll, we'll use the real name. Um, this is Paralabrax clathoratus. And, and so this is a, and a classic example of one of our fish. This is the most collected recreational fish, the, mo the most caught recreational fish in California. Everybody catches these guys. Make for great steak, uh, great fish tacos, etc. Um, a couple of points here that I'm just going to skip, uh, but but a, a few examples. Again, watch my other videos to get to get some of this. But um, much of our world's biomass is in the ocean. You guys know this. The oceans are very deep, right? What's the average depth of the ocean? Impress me. Remember, many weeks ago. How many kilometers deep on average? Right, about four, right? About four kilometers deep. Right, not 20. I know I heard that, Marcus. I, heard that. I wasn't trying to embarrass you when you guys throw out 20, but you know, I did. So, um, so, uh, so we, have, we have a huge amount of biomass and we're harvesting a huge, that little thing, about 2.2%, that doesn't look like a lot, that's a huge amount. That means of all the, the biological synthesis, the protein synthesis and everything in the ocean, we're, we're, we're taking, that, taking that out directly for, for fish, seafood stuff. Um, uh, and then the other thing just to note is when we talk about this stuff, sustainable seafood, we want to be nice. We want to eat healthy. You guys don't want to be fat like me and you want to eat healthy and all that stuff, right? But for a large chunk of the people on the planet, this is not a choice thing. This is to live. So on the order of 1 billion people in Asia, their primary source of protein is, is, is from the sea. So for us, it's a luxury to have seafood. For many folks, if they don't have robust, healthy, well-functioning populations of, of fish and shellfish and things, they are screwed, right? So that's the context of this. Um, uh, again, uh, this is my, my super short version of this, but so what we wanna know is we wanna know how these fish populations are doing. Ideally, our fish populations are healthy, growing, doing well. We use the term, one, one term term here, here, fisheries. Fishery re refers to fish but also anything else, uh, squid, abalone, crab. So fisheries is, a, is used as a generic term. The population of, of one species of fish in a particular area, we refer to as a stock. And so this is a, a so-called stock assessment or, or, or population dynamics. So there's four main things we historically have thought about, and that's how many babies are born into the area, how, how much the, the little guys grow into sexually mature adults, and then individuals that just die because a shark eats them or something like that, and then what you and I, our main way of influencing them, by you and I sucking them out, by you and I capturing and removing organisms from this population. You add all that together and that tells us what's going on with the stock. Increasingly, the future, our, our fisheries are being fished at or beyond the maximum, so-called maximum sustainable yield. Watch one of my videos to understand what that means. But basically, we, we're, we're everywhere on the planet. We're sucking everything out and we're taking stuff to the, to the edge. So one of the approaches that's growing in popularity is this, which is to add in human-induced uh, growth, either by, by doing this in an artificial setting or doing it in, in, a, in a farm setting and then releasing them into the wild, et cetera. So, so increasingly, the future of fisheries population dynamic, all these issues, involves humans augmenting the system as well as humans taking fish out of the system. A um, couple other things. Uh, one of the things you guys need to know about when we do these surveys is this notion of where does it come from? One of the, the biggest breakdowns uh, or highest level breakdowns is um, how do we get this? The two broad categories are aquaculture, meaning growing something in water. The subset of that for for growing critters that touch salt water is mariculture. So mariculture is a subset of aquaculture. Most folks though that you'll encounter doing your surveys, they refer to that as farmed fish. Or, you know, so, so aquaculture, mariculture, fish farming, that's all, the, that's all the same thing. That would be contrasted to um, so-called wild capture or wild caught Seafood, that's where you know, the traditional you and I put our fishing hook in the water 
uh, we capture it, we bring it back. So this graphic, so this data on the bottom from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization uh, tracks, um, uh, and, and uh, another thing here, so this is millions of tons. We usually don't count individuals. We usually do the weight of individuals. So we talk about the production as being uh, biomass. But what's going on here is we've gone, so, so 1950, we're catching, as we're going through time, we're catching more and more fish, catching more and more fish, catching more and more fish, catching more and more fish. If you just look at the top sum of this line, it's still going up. We're, we're, there's more protein, more, more seafood for us. But that masks what's really going on. What's really going on is since about the 1990s, we've stalled out, right? So we're not bringing any more fish in from the wild. So all that new protein, all that additional capacity is coming from the aquaculture and mariculture folks. So it's, it's going up because of fish farming. So fish farming is a growing component of our seafood, um, um, of our seafood. Cool? All right. Another couple things that you need to know about in terms of our survey. Um, so Melvin asked a question, how do you know if it's sustainable? Well, that's a huge complex question. Watch some of the videos to figure it out. But the short version is there's two main ways that you guys can ask about and that and there's two main approaches to this again this lab activity is coming from the perspective of the point of sale consumer of you guys walking into a market you guys walking into a restaurant and trying to figure this out okay so from that perspective you have two primary tools to answer the question other than your knowledge like like two things you can consult when you're not sure one is this approach of eco so-called eco labeling or certifications. And there's various groups and there's various entities. Uh, the most, by far the most widely understood one is Dolphin Safe Tuna. This came from uh, in the, the 80s when we were, we were killing tons of dolphins. One of the ways um, uh, tuna fishermen figured out where the dolphin were, were to look where, where dolphins were feeding on tuna. And so they would go around the tuna, put a purse in, put a big bag net around them, and then zip cinch them up and bring them on deck and sometimes the dolphins would get tagged in there and there was a bunch of very graphic videos that were made by Greenpeace and, and Sea Shepherds and some other activist groups that, that freaked the planet out. And people are like, oh, I'm not going to have tuna anymore. So the, the, world product, the world headquarters of tuna in the 1950s and 60s was San Diego, California. California was the world epicenter of tuna production. That's all collapsed and that doesn't exist anymore. But we still have the business, the, the, the tuna industry, ch um, uh, Chicken of the Sea and, and Star Kiss and all those kind of guys. So they created Dolphin Safe. And they said, what we're going to do is when we harvest these, these tuna, we're going to do it in a slightly different way. We're going to back off on the net, so we're going to allow the dolphins out. They brought in independent observers, and if they met these standards, they got this label, this certification, the so-called Dolphin Safe label. So if you want to eat your tuna, it might be unsustainable for other reasons, but you know at least that these folks were taking actions to minimize the impact on marine mammals of their fishing activity, okay? The most important one, though, is this guy down here. This is MSC. This is Marine Stewardship Council. This is a third-party certification. And again, don't have time to go into all the details right here, but suffice it to say, it's not the company, it's not the enviros, it's not the government, it's a third party like an independent auditor. Not like an independent auditor, it is an independent auditor. So if I'm, if I'm, if I think I'm doing a really good job in doing this, sustainably managing my fishery and using techniques that aren't going to cause bycatch and other kind of impacts to the environment and stuff, I can pay for an assessment by this so-called Marine Stewardship Council. If they assess my production and my, my packaging and all this kind of stuff, they'll say, okay, cool, um, we'll certify you as a sustainable fishery for five years. If that's the case, I get to use this seal of approval, this MSC, so-called MSC um, certification, every single MSC piece of seafood, every box of fish sticks, every whatever aliquot of, of material it is, has this seal and then will have a unique identifying number. You can take that number, go type it into a website and find out where it came from, what the specific or geographic origin of that seafood was, how it was harvested, etc. So that's, those are examples of, of eco labels, right? Certifications. The other approach are these so-called green guides or buying guide approaches. So this doesn't say this individual piece of this, this fish filet was is sustainable, but it says, hey, we're gonna give you some general principles and these things on average will work out for you. And so these are the so-called 
uh, so the most famous of this would be uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program, and that actually inspired this lab activity. So the very first year, we were talking with Seafood Watch and they were having some questions, and so we actually created this lab to actually feed data to Seafood Watch. It ended up, long term, it ended up not working out, but, 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 um, but this was the birth of this lab activity. So what they have is they have originally wallet cards. You can still get these. Now, virtually everybody uses the app. So there's, there's a seafood app. But the basic idea is red, yellow, uh, um, green. Green means if, if that, so you go to this, the restaurant, you want to order some fish tacos. Okay, I want to order some fish tacos. Hey, what's this fish taco? This is, um, I don't know what it is. This is uh, Mahi Mahi. Oh, it's Mahi Mahi? Okay, whip out my, my card or open up my app, type in Mahi Mahi, and, it'll, and is it green? If it's green, go ahead and eat it. If it's, if it's red, don't eat it. This is bad. Either the species not harvest, is not harvested sustainably um, because of the nature of the, the population dynamics, it's not managed well, or the harvest method is overly impactful to the environment. There's a whole variety of reasons why you could be red. Yellow is better than red. It's still not as good as green. So that if you're gonna eat anything, you should probably eat something off the green list, but, but it's a guide, right? So it's the best choice, the avoid, and the well, there's kind of somewhere in between. Every few months, this is evaluated and reassessed. And so, so obviously we were limited. So this, our project started because Seafood Watch wondered if this was the best list of, of items. So we were gonna supply our data to them. They could figure it out. Now they've gone to the app, there's less need for that, right? They used to have, they had limited space. They had to leave stuff off. Now they can, the list can be you know, super long. Okay, so those are two different measures of sustainability, a certification or a guide. Next, our seafood comes from all around the world. So, so it's coming from Alaska, it's coming from Japan, it's coming from, from South America, all over the place. And so that's one of our key questions, is where does this item come from? Um, a little bit closer to us, just real, real briefly, um, so these are the, these are the commercial, major commercial fishing ports in California. When people report where our seafood is from, they rarely, if ever, say the specific geographic location. They instead report the harbor or port where the seafood is off-landed. Landing is where right, the boat comes back and touches land, hence the term landings. And so these are where the fish, fisheries or the, 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 the biomass is offloaded. So Santa Barbara is our largest port, and Ventura is kind of subsumed in this for statistical reasons. Um, uh, we are the most diverse fishing port around, right? Our area, Southern California Bight, way more diverse than the stuff they're bringing into Northern California, et cetera. We are, and so, so this is just total diversity of stuff that's brought into our local ports. This is the value, so we're the most, um, the most uh, uh, valuable port for, for seafood in our, in our state. And um, our region is the, is the greatest rank in terms of weight. Most of this weight comes from um, a squid, a lolligo, market squid. And I have a, a quick video from last week when I was doing fire surveys. Um, the, the squid fleet is now right off the Malibu coast. There's a deep canyon that I like to fish there. And so, so a lot of this biomass is coming from our squid catch. Um, and I'm not gonna show you any more slides, just to show that there's a diversity of things that come in. Um, to our ports, all, or, everything from sea urchins and sea cucumbers to halibut and, and crabs and things. We harvest seafood with a variety of tools, everything from nets to traps to harpoons, etc. cetera. Um, and, and some seafood is more valuable than others, but you guys are gonna figure this out when we start going through the prices. Um, and yeah, the. Trump administration. So one of our main tools to protect our fisheries is to use marine protected areas. So areas where nobody can fish and unfortunately our current federal administration is interested in, in reducing those protections. What you're looking at, if I want you guys to go over here and open the candidate sites. So if we open that up, they're gonna see two tabs. You're gonna see a tab where we've surveyed restaurants in the past and markets in the past. Uh, everything is organized by county and then by city. And so uh, all these things are listed. In some cases, the restaurant is no longer there or it's changed its name. And so they'll see some notes and some, some cross outs and things. 
you guys are gonna eventually do for me two markets and four restaurants, okay? Um, but for this first pass, for this week, I just want you to sign up for one market and two restaurants to start with, okay? Um, so uh, you can have a look at this. We wanna get a diversity of places. We, I don't want everybody to go to McDonald's or some cheap place, right? We gotta to go to some expensive place. We gotta to go to some place in Santa Barbara. We gotta to go to some place that way. We, we, we wanna, just like with our public opinion poll surveys, we want a representative sample of what's going on. So they move the markets. Sometimes some, some of you guys will do some big markets. Some will do some small markets, right? So we want to cover the range. Okay, so let me explain what we're going to do first. So you guys are going to go to these things. Again, we're doing point of sale surveys. So you're going to go to some restaurants. You're going to go to some markets. And you're going to do a little bit of questioning, but not like our old last time. You're going to ask a few questions. And then you're going to articulate all the seafood items for sale. The only absolute hard and fast rule is that you, you can only survey an institution that sells seafood. So if you go to a restaurant, maybe it's changed names, right? If it's in the same location, you can still do it. But if they don't serve a single fish taco, if they don't serve a single whatever, you, you can't do it, right? So we're not surveying all of our businesses, we're surveying seafood purveyors, okay? Uh, uh, we'll come back to how we do the filling out of this in a second, but um, or excuse me, how we fill out the seafood items. But this is what's going to happen. So I'm going to go in. I'm going to fill this out, and there's some questions. So I'm going to say my name. I'm going to say what the restaurant is, day, week. Oh, one other quick thing. When you're doing this, we write down the name of the restaurant, right, and the location, so we can keep track and we can compare year to year and that kind of stuff. We never release that information. We will never release that information. So we're not gonna say, we're not gonna give an award to the best seafood restaurant. We're not gonna yell at and point fingers at the people that are the least sustainable, okay? We're not doing that. So if somebody asks you, we say, well, this is, we're, we're recording this, but this is, ju um, this, is, this is just like before. This is a class project. Sorry, I have this AHO professor that makes us do this. But it's a class activity I'm doing. And so, but we're, so we're, the point here is not to do gotcha or to get somebody or get somebody in trouble or make somebody a saint, okay? But we do need to know where we are. So then you say day of the week, et cetera. Do your surveys not when people are freaking out. Don't go to dinner rush hour, right? Don't go to, to you know, when everybody's buying, buying their seafood for the weekend, you know, you know go to some off time so, so that you can actually ask these folks questions. So there's two, two components to this, and the restaurants and the markets are similar. So the first are some general questions of the person doing the selling. So this would be, in a, in a restaurant, this would be the wait staff. So the waiter or waitress. In the markets, this would be the fishmonger. This would be the guy behind the fish counter, okay? And so this is how it's gonna go. So I'm gonna go in here, I'm gonna say language used. So some years we've done Spanish and everything, we're running out of time, we're not gonna do Spanish, we're just gonna do English language. So everybody here is gonna do this in English. Okay, so English, boom, time and date and blah, blah, blah. Next, this is one that um, some of you guys have been asking me, so I decided to add it in. We've never done this before, but I'll just have you guys ask. So has your business been impacted by our recent fires? So are people buying more seafood? Are, they, are, are you having a tough time? Is your business doing okay? Is it not doing okay? Right, we don't need to be, a, be super detailed, but we wanna know, has there been any impacts? If it's in Ventura, obviously that would be more like the, the last year's Thomas fire hurt you guys. Have you guys recovered from that? If it's somewhere in Thousand Oaks or, or Agura Hills or something, right? It's more like the recent Woolsey fires. But let's ask him, were you, were you impacted? And then how are you impacted, right? So, that, so that, that's a, a weird variant that we'll add in here. Okay, next. Is there, are there any, in some of these things, you don't have to ask people, you just do it yourself. So I walk in, are there any Prop 65 signs? Prop 65 was uh, passed several years ago. It was one of the stepchilds of, of San Senator Alan Cranston. And the idea here was um, we want to tell people about, this, this is the classic one you see when you go to pump gas. There's those black and white signs and it says, the substances known in the state of California that cause cancer in this gasoline, right? So anytime someone is in a business that has potentially toxic substances, you're supposed to notify the public. Great idea and concept and execution, maybe not so great because every, there's a sign everywhere, right? Turns out we have, 
uh, one of the challenges with our seafood right now is mercury, is heavy metal contamination. Our top predators are sharks, our tilefish, things like that, um, have accumulated a very high level of mercury in some cases, such that little kids, people with compromised immune system, or any of you young ladies that might potentially be pregnant, you can't eat as much as old fat dudes, males like me can, right? In terms of your, your uh, risk of exposure to methylated mercury and things. So technically speaking, if these guys are serving shark or tuna or anything like that, they should probably have a Prop 65 sign up. So this question is just, do you see it? So when you walk in the restaurant, do you see a Prop 65 sign, yes or no? Okay, good. Number next, we wanna get a sense of, uh, uh, is this uh, is this like a, a pure seafood place or is this a place that serves a, a, a fish taco or two? So to do that, we're gonna um, organize the output by appetizers and by entrees. So kind of main dishes and then other things. So what you're gonna do in this case, you're gonna count up how many appetizers are they selling, how many, how many entrees, and then uh, just in general, and how many have at least one piece of seafood in them. And then for that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, uh, put that down. So 10%, 100%, 60%, something like that. Um, what if it's like a place that offers like, oh, you can have chicken or shrimp with this What would that be counted? I would, I would, I would have the shrimp be count. I would count this. I would count this. I'd be the most seafoody read of the, of the, of the menu. Okay. Um, okay, there we go. Now we come, for most of you guys, so these next questions are asked of server one and server two. You don't have to do two servers. If you were just hanging out, if you're stuck in a blizzard and you had some time and the wait staff was just bored, you could ask two different wait staff. But you just have to do one, you don't have to do two. So, so originally people were getting really rambunctious and asking a bunch of people. Okay, so the first one says, so I'm sitting here at this restaurant, hey, can I ask you a quick question? Waitress comes over, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, so I wanna know, um, I'm, I'm doing this survey, my, my, my stupid professor makes me do this, so sorry, we're just doing this thing. But I just wanna ask you a couple of really quick questions. So my first question is, um, are you familiar with MSC or Seafood Watch or, or any way to select uh, sustainable seafood? And he or she's gonna say yes or no. So I'm gonna put it down, right? I'm not gonna critique, I'm not gonna make it, if they wanna ask you questions, say, I can answer some questions after, but I first gotta go through, just like our public opinion poll, right? I can an answer questions after, but let me go through this first. So have you ever heard of any of these things, right? We're being super generous. And again, with all this stuff, we're not calling them if we think they're lying. Right? So this is, we're not, we're not testing them, we're not trying to trick them. This is just, again, your Joe Blow that walks off the street and you want to know, can I make an informed decision? Can I get this information? Well, so yes or no. Number next is, is how many of your customers, say in an average week, ask about you know, seafood sustainability or how sustainable the seafood is, right? They might say, none, and you're like, okay, none. Ideally, we'd like a percentage but whatever they say, they say, right? If they say like about two, I'd say, okay. And how many, how many people do you have on a typical shift? You know, you, we want some kind of relative measure, right? So, um, I don't know, you're the first. Okay, thanks, that's zero, right? <laughs> Which would be a common answer. Next is, how many customers ask about where their, their seafood um, uh, comes from? Like w w where it originates from? Same thing, I don't know, nobody. Okay, then, nobody, good. The next is, Okay, so finish those questions. So my last question for you is, what's, if anybody asks anything about your seafood on your menu, what's the most common thing they ask? And whatever they say, just put it down, right? Um, maybe they'll ask, is it farm raised or wild caught? Maybe they're, at, maybe they're asked, how did you prepare it? Did you put butter in it? You know, whatever. So whatever they say, you put it in. Cool? And that's it. And there's a spot for you to make some general comments. You want to comment something, oh, this place is really skanky, it looks super sketch, I probably wouldn't eat here. Or these people were super helpful asking these questions and, and they thought about it, whatever. Just, again, this is, when we do this data analysis, these are people that weren't you. So provide whatever extra detail that will help um, somebody in the future or your fellow students interpret this, okay? All right, now, for the thing. So here we go, main thing, boom, here's, here's my menu. I'm gonna put down any dish that has seafood in it. I'm gonna say the name of the dish. I'm gonna, I'm gonna check off, is it you know, a little tick mark, is it appetizer, entree, what the species is. 
So if you don't know, if it doesn't say in the menu, you could ask the wait stuff. Hey, so this thing said fish tacos. What's the fish in your fish tacos? The answer might be, I don't know, fish. In which case, you just put unknown fish or unknown shrimp or unknown whatever, right? If they have more detail, Alaskan salmon. Well, there's many species, but we know at least from Alaska. Is it king salmon, right? So as, as, as much as you can get, cool. Don't spend hours doing this, right? But we want to know, again, if you walk off the street and they said, so if someone said, I'd like a salad. Oh, vegetables. And you're like, uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the vegetable in the salad? I don't know, vegetables, right? We probably wouldn't buy that salad. But when it's seafood, we're trained to say, oh, it's just random fish that have no idea where it fucking comes from? Yeah, sure, I'll buy that, right? So, so let's investigate that. Next, you're going to say how much the dish costs. And then the location. So this, and again, it might be I don't know or they don't know, which is, which is OK, right? Uh, and then so for this one, fish okay, USA, Alaska, you know, what, as much information as they can give you, put it down. And then these guys, these are tick, these, these are tick boxes, right? So how was it, how, what, was the, what was the source of the capture of the fish? Was it MSC? Was it MSC certified? I put a tick mark there. Was it farm raised? I put a tick there. It was just regular wild caught. Was it dolphin safe? Or something else, if it says something specific, I'm gonna write in that other, I say other, and I'm gonna put it over here. Or they just say, don't know, right? So, two, 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 two. Jonathan. Where, where do we look for these kind of things at a restaurant? You know, like, you go to the market, you'll have it on the package, but at a restaurant. Well, so I'd start with the menu. See if it says something on the menu. And if not, then I, I, would, I would write this down so I have it all ready to go. And then I would ask the waiter or waitress to come over and say, can I ask you a quick question? Just wondering about the seafood. So can you tell me where the crab comes from? Can you tell me you know, that kind of stuff? I mean, obviously, we don't want to spend an hour with the wait staff, right? But, but again, these are people that are selling food that you're going to eat. Presumably, they should at least theoretically know where that, or what, what, what that food is, right? We don't call it meat. I would like a meat sandwich, please. Right? If it said meat sandwich, you'd be like, I'm not buying that. Right? Sure? Well, I mean, I probably would, but anyway, so, okay. So then, um, and then we just have, okay, so, so, that, so that's that one, okay? The next one is your supermarket option. So this is very, in broad strokes, very similar to what we just did. Oops, what the heck happened there? Very similar to what we just discussed, okay? Same basic idea. It's a little teeny bit of a variant. So in this case, everything else is the same. But notice right here, it's not, it's not entree and appetizers. It's the amount of the meat counter that's devoted to seafood. So again, I don't want you to spend hours and hours in doing this. But if there's six bays of the meat department and two of those are seafood, I'm just going to say 33%, right? One third, right? So, I'm not, so we want approximate estimates, right? And then the same thing for the freezer space. So there's, there's a whole line of freezers and there's two bays that are, that are this and you know what I mean? So percentages. So what percentages? Again, this is to help us understand, is this a place that hardly does anything with seafood or is this a place that seafood is a major part of their, of their business? Uh, same questions here to the, to the fishmonger. Oh, yeah, uh, I got to Yeah. So this again, has your business been impacted by the fires? Again, those same questions. And then it's, uh, hey, are you familiar with MSC, Seafood Watch, or any of these other sustainable seafood, uh, you know, uh, approaches? Yes, no. Okay, cool. Next is, hey, how many of your customers ask about, again, these are the same questions as before, et cetera. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Now it comes down to naming stuff. So here we go. So now it's not, it's not the, the dish name, it's the product name, right? Star, star kissed six ounce tuna or something, right? Uh, and, then, and then the species, again, whatever the species is. In this case, these are tick, tick boxes. So was it unprepared fit, fresh? Is that just sitting in the meat counter, right? Is it, which would just be like a naked uh, uh, salmon filet. Is it a prepared Fresh. So is it something like ceviche sitting in there? Again, by preparing it, there's extra costs that go in there, right? So that's what, that's what that definition is. Same thing. Is it unprocessed frozen? Is it just frozen fillets sitting in there? Okay, cool. Our best data will come from the unprepared fresh and the unprepared frozen because that should just be the price of the fish, 
not the labor of the guys to bake it and put the breadcrumbs and all that kind of stuff on it. So that, that's, our, that's our cleanest data set. Uh, it could be processed frozen, it could be fish sticks, right? So it's frozen, but it's been somehow processed and cooked or something. And then the last option here says processed canned. That's the everything else bin. So it could be canned, it could also be bagged, it could package, so it just means something that's not frozen or, 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 or in the refrigerator, right? So any kind of packaging, not just canned, okay? All right, in the case of the can or whatever, we got, we got to say how much it weighs. You can skip the count, that's, we don't really use that anymore. The weight, and then, okay, then uh, the price. So if it's a can of tuna, you're just gonna write the price down. And if you're going to a store that has, you know, uh, 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 club members discount, no, 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 no. We want the default regular price, what we want, okay? And so I'm gonna write that down, and then later we can calculate how much it is per ounce. If it's something in the, in the, in the fish monger's cabinet, it's gonna give you a price per pound. So that you can, so you can put it in that column if that's the case. And then just like before, fish, fishery location, where does it come from? If there's a specific brand, Starkist, something, put that down. Sometimes some of these places have a processing location. So put that down. And then just like before, tick mark, is it MSC, is it farm raised, is it da, 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 da? If it's MSC, you can put the number down and that's it, okay? You will articulate every item that has seafood in it. So for big markets, that, that's, that's a lot of stuff, right? But that's what we gotta do. So the restaurants are pretty easy to do by yourself. Um, my strong suggestion is do the markets with a buddy, with a partner. And then I'm gonna go help her do her, her restaurants, uh, her, her market, excuse me. Trust me, years of experience. If you partner with someone, it goes more than twice as fast as you think it would. It's way, way faster with two people. It's insanely more faster than with two people. If, you, if it's only just you and you can only go on Friday at night, of course you can do it by yourself. But it goes a lot faster. So, so, so a partner coming and helping me do it and then me going and helping him or her do theirs will be faster in many cases than you doing your one market by yourself. I know it doesn't sound right, but 99% it, it, of the time that's how it works out, okay? And then we have a data sheet. You're gonna type it in the data sheet and enter it just like before. As with other stuff, I want you guys to down, where is it? As with other stuff, I want you guys to, so the data entry, here, here's the data entry sheet. I want you to download this, type in your data, right? Offline, have that archived. And then when it comes time to enter it, just copy and paste it in, right? So we can avoid that problem of it hanging and all that kind of stuff. And you have your copy saved in case someone accidentally pastes over your data, right? Cool? All right, so looking back to what the last thing we're doing today is, uh, if we just go to our candidate sites, you guys are plopping your name down next to two restaurants and one market. 